All right, thank you, Will. Um, I will. All right, is everyone, are you seeing my, my slides correctly? My first slide? Yep, looks good. Okay, excellent. Um, so as Will said, um, I have just moved uh, from the University of Montreal over to McGill, um, which is in the same city of Montreal. So I've just hopped over our, uh, our central park, which is Mount Royal. Um, and uh, I'm part of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology and the Genome Center and part of a quantitative life sciences training program. Um, and I put the URL up for that um, for any PhD students who might be interested in applying. So the question I'm going to be asking today is an old one, uh, which is basically why are there so many species? Um, why is it that some lineages produce more species than others? What controls all of this diversity? This is an old question that has been asked by Darwin, Elton, Hutchison um, in a more bacterial context, more recently by Dijkhausen, uh, and hopefully many of you as well. So a more formal way of posing this question uh, is what controls the rate of diversification or speciation. And we can think about abiotic factors, so things like temperature, latitudinal gradients, pH. We know that there's more species and more speciation, presumably, uh, near uh, the equator and the tropics. So there can be these kind of um, abiotic drivers or limiting factors of speciation. Uh, and less explored are biotic factors. So these are things like competition, mutualism, predation. And there are two competing models, uh, which are not mutually exclusive, but we can think of them as um, alternative ends of a spectrum of how the initial diversity in a community, so this is what I'll, I'll often plot on, uh, on the x-axis here, right? So standing diversity in a community, how will that affect the diversification or, or speciation of one particular species? So the first prediction I'm gonna call um, ecological controls, and I'll usually sort of color code in blue. And the prediction here is that more diverse communities basically have all of their niches filled and there's essentially no room for new species. So there's no room for, for speciation. So it predicts this negative relationship between community diversity and diversification. In contrast is diversity begets diversity, which predicts a positive relationship. So this would be sort of niche construction, positive feedbacks, where we can have things like cross feedings, other beneficial interactions that might create more niches and uh, favor diversification. So people have studied um, these, two, uh, these two predictions, EC versus DVD, uh, in a range of systems. So from experimental evolution using microbes, uh, we have, depending on the system, um, depending on the experimental details and setup, we can get evidence for um, EC or DVD. So sort of uh, conflicting results. Uh, similarly, people have looked at plants and animals in nature and again found varying evidence for one or the other model. The question I'm going to consider today is what about bacteria in the wild? So um, uh, this represents the, the majority of, uh, of genetic diversity on earth and, and, and so um, this might be sort of the ultimate test of this, of this question is um, to what extent does diversity beget diversity in the wild? So this is the thesis project, or one of the thesis projects of Naima Mahdi, a PhD student um, in my lab, who did most of the work I'm going to show you, um, in collaboration with Mikhail Vos at the University of Exeter, who we've been working with this on for the past uh, year or so. What data did we use? Well, we used uh, the Earth Microbiome Project. So this is a, a truly communal catalog. Uh, this data is uh, the, the product of multiple people who contributed samples uh, from across the world. And the, the sampling is as standardized as possible so that um, the, the diversity estimates are comparable. Uh, and these were all um, sequenced with 16S ribosome RNA gene amplicons, um, from which we get amplicon sequence variants, or ASVs. Um, there's about uh, over 150,000 uh, 150, uh, individual ASVs in this, in this data set. 
And importantly, we rarify this data set to 5,000 sequences per, uh, per sample in each of 2,000 samples. And this is an important step uh, because we don't want to see any trivial um, evidence for DVD, so a positive relationship that's just due to sampling effort. So we control for that up front. So as I said, the Earth Microbiome Project uh, has samples from all over the world, uh, spanning free living environments um, from water and sediments and soil, host associated from animals and plants, and uh, you know, globally distributed across the world. So this is a really nice sampling of, um, of diverse biomes. So how are we gonna distinguish among these, uh, these two hypotheses? So traditionally, we think of an evolutionary diversification model um, where the initial diversity will control the diversity in a focal lineage. Okay, so let's say in one sample, we have um, two genera, okay? So um, genus one and then genus two in purple is gonna be our focal genus that we're considering, which gives rise to two species or ASVs. So we'll put a point here at one on the x-axis. So one uh, non-focal genus gives rise to two species or ASVs within our focal genus. And then another sample, uh, we'll put a point at three, four, where we have three genera and within our focal genus, uh, it gives rise to four species or ASCs. And drawing a, a line through these is a positive slope. So this would be an example that shows evidence for DVD. Uh, in contrast, we could get the opposite pattern, giving a negative slope. That would be um, evidence for a niche filling model, um, ecological controls, or EC. Now, uh, people have usually considered DVD in terms of this kind of evolutionary diversification model, but in the, at the resolution of the Earth Microbiome Project and 16S sequencing, where we have these individual microbiome samples, uh, we don't expect evolutionary diversification to be happening or, or not to be detectable at the resolution of this one um, slow evolving marker gene. So our model um, is probably more of a community assembly model, but it still works in the same kind of way, but I'll, I, I'll walk you through it. So um, here we would start with a, a, a community uh, that starts with one uh, genus. So one unique um, ASV from genus, which uh, allows for two migrants to arrive from our focal genus. In a DVD model, uh, the more initial diversity in the community shown in black will provide more niches and this sort of positive feedback, uh, which will give rise to, to DVD in this community assembly model. In contrary, um, under the, the EC model, uh, we essentially have a set carrying capacity where if we start with one ASV to begin with, there's room for, let's say, four more. And if we start with three, then there's room for two more. Okay, so this would give rise to an EC model under this community assembly model. All right, so back to the logic of the, um, the, the um, evolutionary diversification model. Uh, we, could, we can do this, um, uh, as, as I said before, at the ASV per species level. We can do it genus per family or walking down the phylogenetic tree or the taxonomy family per order, order per class for phylum. Okay, so we can look at these more inclusive uh, taxonomic groups. And so to do this, we're going to do this in a statistical framework of generalized linear mixed models, where we're going to try to predict uh, the number of ASVs in a focal genus as a function of the number of non-focal genera in the community. So the community diversity, how will that affect the, the diversity within a focal group? We're going to include some random effects uh, so the sample identity, the, um, the, the submitting laboratory to the, the, the EMP, um, these are sort of nuisance factors, and more interestingly, the environment type and the, the lineage or, uh, or genus identity. Uh, so to make a long story short, uh, the effects of sample ID and laboratory are, are, are minimal, uh, but there are some interesting effects of environment and lineage, which I will get into. Um, and here I just put the URL for a preprint that we have out uh, most of these results are, are, are in there, so you can go check out um, all the, the details there. 
All right, so uh, we see that this diversity slope varies across lineages and environments. You can see uh, significant positive slopes in red, significant negative slopes in blue, and non-significant slopes in gray. Uh, this is at the level of phyla, down to genera, across uh, four different representative environments, the gut, rhizosphere, sediment, and soil. Uh, these are just representative, but we have, um, we have 17 total different environments. So um, you don't see much just looking at this, but um, to abstract it a bit more, uh, we see this pattern where this diversity slope is generally positive. So, so DVD is a general pattern, um, and it tends to uh, reach a plateau as community diversity increases. This is at the level of phyla. So we can see that um, more diverse free living uh, environments have lower DVD. DVDs, they seem to, to reach a slope compared to these um, host-associated um, uh, biomes. Importantly, this pattern, uh, we don't see it in, in a null model where we randomize the data table. And this is work for, by a postdoc uh, in my lab, Carbon Leo Morale, with uh, Professor Pierre Lejean. It also seems like abiotic factors probably can't uh, explain this pattern overall. Possibly in soil, uh, so in a, in a particular soil data set, it seems that biomes that have reached this sort of plateau of DVD, so down near here, might have their diversity controlled uh, more by abiotic factors once they reach this plateau. Finally, we asked, uh, is the strength of DVD related to genome size? Uh, and to test this, we simply added uh, genome size into the model, uh, a representative genome size for each genus. And we find uh, that, in fact, uh, larger genomes seem to experience more DVD. So a focal genus with a larger genome um, ha has an increased diversity slope, right? Where its diversification rate in response to community diversity increases more uh, when genome size is larger. Um, how to explain this? Well, maybe uh, bacteria with larger gene repertoires could allow more opportunities for positive interactions, things like cross-feeding, uh, niche construction, and so on, uh, that would allow them to experience uh, stronger DVD. So uh, to summarize, um, this EMP survey data really complements existing theory um, and experiments from, from experimental evolution at really a bird's eye view of um, what are the most uh, predominant patterns in nature. Uh, the punchline is that DVD seems to initially be strong in less diverse communities, but as diversity fills up, we do get a plateau, uh, presumably as niches are filled. And as these niches fill, um, the abiotic drivers uh, might become more important. Uh, mechanisms are still um, unclear, so things like niche, uh, niche construction and cross-feeding uh, could be important, but we need more work to, to look into that. So I will uh, wrap up there. I've already thanked my, uh, my collaborators um, who helped with this work, and I'll take questions if there's a minute or two. Wonderful. Thank you for the talk. Um, always good to see a talk saying cross-feeding is important. Um, there's a question from Suyan Espinoza Miranda uh, saying, great talk, and uh, wondering about how stress might influence this. So upon addition of antibiotics to microbial communities, do you think this theory of diversity begets diversity is higher than in communities with no external stress? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's some interesting work by Angus Buckling and, I, and probably some other people on this recently that has, um, I'm gonna try to summarize this, which is I, I, I think that the effect uh, can be different where if you, um, uh, where E. coli, for example, if, if you try to evolve resistance in E. coli uh, with or without a surrounding microbial community, um, I'm going to get the direction of the results uh, wrong here. I, I, I think that uh, it's, it is more likely to evolve resistance alone than in the presence of the community. I think that's, that's right. <laughs> I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the chat. It's a, it's a, a, a PLOS biology paper that came out recently. Uh, but I do think that the, the, it, it could vary depending on, uh, on whether we're talking about stress or, or sort of steady state.
if there is such a thing as a steady state. Uh, and then maybe uh, just one last question in the interest of time. Uh, Mike Blazeman is wondering, do you see any differences in DBD that depend on the level that you look at? I'm imagining that's phylogenetic level. Right, yeah, exactly. So um, uh, it's a great question. Uh, it does seem actually that, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back here. Um, so here, this is at really a broad, so here I'm showing community, community diversity at the level of phyla. So we, we actually do see pretty strong effects um, at, at the level of um, order, family, even, even phylum. So this does point to sort of a, a certain um, coherence of these broader taxonomic groups, which ordinarily, you know, you think maybe they're just names, but it, it, it does seem like there, there is coherent signal at these more inclusive groups. Um, now we're looking at sort of more fine-grained metagenomic data to, to, to try to zoom in on um, more of a diversification model where you're actually getting um, not, as, not speciation, but generation of diversity really at, at, at fine levels um, within a species. Uh, great. Well, there are a series of uh, additional questions, which we'll move over to the rocket.